Alright, I'm going to talk a little bit about my recording process and what I do inside the computer, what I do in hardware, um, my workflow, I suppose. Um, so, over there, I've got all of my Electron gear, well, except for that. Um, got an Octatrack, Analog 4, Machine Drum, Mono Machine. Uh, I also have set up the top there a Roland System 1M. Uh, I bought that <clears throat> to replace my Roland SH-101, which I sold last year. Um, I sold it because it needed a service, I'm kind of like a bit over vintage gear because of all of the maintenance that you need to do with it. Uh, I also was sort of itching to have a new synth, um, and this way I got to have my 101, sort of, uh, in terms of the plug out. And I also got to have a new synth, so I was really happy with that. Um, System 1M is awesome. Uh, it's probably one of the best synths I've heard for bass. Um, and I'm talking about analog synths as well. Uh, I used to have a Moog Minotaur. Um, this is better <laughs> for bass, I'm not sure how, it just is. Um, but yeah, basically last year I sold a bunch of gear, I had a whole bunch of gear, um, I'll, th I'll show some photos in this video of my old studio, but I had uh, heaps of vintage stuff, I had a Kurzweil, I had, um, fuck what else, I had a, a Virus, um, I had a Yamaha CS10, I had a Novation Base Station um, rack, um, I had a Moog uh, Sub Fatty, um, SH-101, like I said, um, oh, Roland MKS-70, uh, Super JX, um, and an Alpha Juno as well. I had a bunch of shit, uh, I'll show pictures, like I said, um, but I sold heaps of it. I was just like, my workflow is stagnating, I wasn't sure what to do, um, I felt like I was trapped in workflows that these that this gear um, had set out for me, like I'd just sort of fallen into patterns and I really wanted to abandon that. I also sort of felt like I maybe needed some of the money so I just got rid of heaps of shit. I kept all my Electron stuff. Um, I kept my Insonic keyboards which are behind me. Um, but other than that <laughs> I pretty much got rid of everything. Um, and I am very happy I did. I miss those keyboards sometimes or those uh, synths sometimes but these days I'm just like nah this is better. Um, until you know and of course until I discover that my current workflow isn't working for me anymore. Um, so basically, the way I make music is I uh, I start with hardware, usually, um, whether it's me playing on a keyboard, um, although these days it's usually me sequencing on Electron stuff, uh, even MIDI sequencing through them, like with the Octatrack, I sequence the System YM. I also use the Octatrack to sequence my Ensonic keyboards a lot of the time, and I've done a video about that before, uh, which you can link to here. Um, <clears throat> but once I've done that, once I've made patterns and I've uh, sort of, you know, got the basis for a song, whether it's just a, a short basis or like a fully fleshed out, like multiple sections and stuff, um, once I've done that I just record it all into live. Um, <clears throat> I've been, I've actually been processing things through the heat as well before I record in, but that's a new thing because I've only just got that. Um, but yeah, I record it into live, and once I've got my loops in live, um, and I often record quite long loops, like often even up to like 64 bars, <laughs> just because sometimes uh, the patches I make on like the Mono Machine or System 1 or whatever, um, they evolve a lot uh, over time, and I want to capture all of that uh, evolution, all of that nuance. And with the Octatrack, I set up heaps of scenes and stuff, and when I record it in, I record it in um, like a performance, kind of like if I have a drum beat or, or like, you know, a, a rhythm, um, I'll be using the crossfader heaps, uh, especially at the ends of bars and stuff with lots of effects to just sort of give it an organic, constantly changing flavour. I mean, I'm, I'm all about that. I like, I like things to always be changing, always be different, even if the melodies stay the same, or even if the core beat stays the same, I just want things to always be sounding fresh in a track. Um, so once I've done that, like I say, I always in the computer once I've got the loops going, then it's just a case of arrangement. And I'm not saying that what I'm doing is particularly like, you know, 
uh, what do you call it, like innovative workflow. I'm sure a lot of people work like this, but I feel like um, I feel like creatively, it's more uh, it's more creative. It's more in inspiring to use hardware when you are first developing something. It's not always true. I sometimes write songs just in the computer as well, but for me, I just feel like I'm playing. And I don't mean like playing, I mean like I'm playing, like a kid would play when I when I use hardware. Uh, even if it's something like a Kurzweil K2000, which I used to have like menu-based operation and everything, even with the Ensonic stuff, which is all menu-based, I still feel like I'm having fun with that, like it's a playful time. And then once I've played, um, and I put it all in the computer, then it becomes more analytical and it becomes more about uh, my own personal tastes, about how song structures should go and it becomes more experimental in terms of how things build and how things evolve and change and that becomes very nuanced because, um, you know, the tools in the computer are just so much more advanced, you know, you can even if the sound sources are hardware, once it's in there you can just do so much with it um, and that's what I usually do so that's kind of the basics of it. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, I guess, sort of talk my way through the beginnings of a track, um, like on the hardware, where they start, and what they've turned into once they've gone into the computer. Um, yeah, so uh, stay tuned. <laughs> More to come. Okay, so I've got the Octatrack and the Analog 4 and the System 1M up here. Um, these are the instruments that I used uh, on this track and that we're going to run through the parts on them. Um, I've also got the Ensonic TS-12 over there behind me. Um, the Octatrack controls that. It also controls the System 1M. Um, but the System 1M goes into the Analog 4's inputs, uh, gets some effects applied to it. That's always how I record the Roland System 1M. Um, so anyway, let's just get stuck into it. Um, I've got a few, I've only got one audio source on this, which is a drum beat, and then everything else is a MIDI track. And on here I've got, I think, uh, three audio, or three uh, synth tracks, but I only end up using two of them. Um, so this is the beat I made. So as you can see, or as you can hear, uh, it's a really sick beat, um, very uh, full and rich, and it's just uh, originated as a, a loop, 104 b 40 BPM loop in fact. Um, I slowed it right down to, um, to 80, and I've applied a whole bunch of effects to it. Uh, let's have a look at what I've got here, uh, I've got a lo-fi. Um, which is being um, modulated by the scenes, um, so a lot of sample rate reduction and bit rate reduction. Uh, I've also got a compressor, which just, you know, boosts everything. It also is being used by one of the scenes. Um, and I've also got a neighbor track, which uh, the first track feeds into. Um, that's got some filtering on it with the scenes too, as you can see there. Um, and also a, a DJ equalizer, which is just a processor just to, uh, you know, boost some of the, the mids and take out some, uh, oh, boost some of the lows as well. Well, it's just boosting everything, really. Just uh, some EQ. So that's the only audio, um, or the only sample tracks I've got running uh, on this Octatrack. Uh, these are unmuted. They're, they're unmuted, but nothing's happening on them. Um, I've got some MIDI tracks running, though. So this first track is uh, controlling the Ensonic TS-12. Uh, it's a bass sound, <clears throat> and it sounds like this. So 
So I like that sound, I think it's pretty cool. Um, but we've also got some other tracks. Um, we've got this controls the System 1M. I don't think I ended up using this one. Uh, let's have a listen to it anyway though. So that's all pretty cool. I didn't end up using it. I feel like this track got a little bit uh, too busy. I, I created a lot of parts for it and some of them just had to go. So let's uh, just mute them for the moment. Um, and I've got one more part going to the end Sonic, which is for like a sort of bridge part later in the track. Um, I'm just going to change the patch real quick on the TS-12 so we can hear that. So it's kind of like a mellow sine wave kind of pad sound. Um, comes in a bit later in the track. When we go to the computer, I'll show you how that works. Um, and yeah, it's kind of like a little nice little bass melody uh, for lead lines to go over the top of. Um, I've got one more track here. I also don't think this one ended up getting used, um, but it's for, let's have a listen. Yeah, this one didn't end up getting used, um, but you know, we'll uh, talk more about the Ensonic when we go to the computer because I, I did sequence some stuff in the computer as well uh, for this track after I'd recorded all of this in. So that's the Octa track. <clears throat> Let's just move on from that real quick over to the Analog 4 over here. Um, so on this track we've got... This uh, lead line, which is a pretty important part of the track, it it's certainly in the beginning half of the track. What I'm going to do though is I'm going to uh, keep that in. I'm going to bring in the bass from the Ensonic, and I'm going to bring in the drum beat, and we're going to listen to the whole thing together. So you get sort of the idea of where this track is going, um, it's kind of a real slow grind. Um, so <clears throat> there's one other bass element on the Analog 4 which I'll just bring in now. I'll just show it to you by itself first though, it sounds like this. So I'm just going to slowly bring in some elements.
So, a nice sort of clicky, super low frequency bass sound with some uh, parameter locks going on it. Um, basically, we've got some uh, uh, super low sub oscillator running on this one. Uh, the oscillator to is tuned slightly differently as well. But then I've also got parameter locks happening on here, like the tuning changes there. Uh, I know I've got some uh, envelope, pitch envelope going as well here. Um, pitch, uh, the envelope of pitch one, sorry, the uh, pitch of oscillator one is being affected by envelope two. Um, to give it that sort of, uh, how do you say it, that falling note, uh, that sort of note dive that's in there. Um, <clears throat> So I feel like it's a pretty complex sound, even though it just sounds quite gritty and grimy. Uh, they've got one more sound on here, and it goes like this. Now that's all I'm going to play of that one, because I didn't end up using it. That's uh, something that got recorded, but just sort of got left out in the end. Um, so, just up here I've got the System 1M, um, we haven't really looked at it, I'm just going to tilt the camera up real quick and just sort of, I don't know, just mess with this patch just a little bit, just so you can get an idea. I really like this synth a lot, so I'll just hold that there, and I'll play a sequence over here. <laughs> so I guess that's maybe like a little preview for a video that I'll do all about the Roland System 1M at some point. Um, so anyway, that's enough over here. Let's look at the computer just over there and see where this track ended up. Okay, so we're at the computer now, as you can see. Um, and uh, I'm just going to go through these sort of track by track. Um, basically, I've got... Uh, I divide my, I, I have my template live setup um, that I like to use, which is basically five groups of tracks. Each group has two stereo tracks in it, and they're all dedicated to recording in the Octatrack, the Analog 4, the Machine Drum, and the Mono Machine. And in addition to that, the uh, mixer over here, which a bunch of my other gear feeds into, then goes into my Miko audio interface, not sorry, not audio interface, uh, preamp, which then goes into my audio interface digitally. Um, so I've got, like I said, five of these groups, which uh, I sort of can do anything with, with all of the gear in my studio. Um, obviously, if the Octatrack has more than two tracks running on it, I can add more tracks. I just feel like that's a good base level because often I don't use more than one or two tracks um, per machine. So, I've got this drum beat here, which we already heard. Let's have a listen again. So, I recorded 16 bars of this, because I'm a, a madman. Um, but I just like to have, like I said earlier, I like to have variation. I like to have things evolve. Um, and uh, there's a lot of scene crossfading going on in this track, in this uh, drum beat, so I wanted to capture all of that, like the variations, so as you can hear here. Or over here. So anyway, uh, with this beat, <clears throat> I've also added, I've laid on top of a, oh, on top of a battery track, um, a native instruments battery with these two kick drums. Um, and they basically just sound like this. Which 
which when you layer it with the other beat sort of becomes indistinguishable but it just gives that the kick drums just more punch you know so yeah um and <laughs> naturally as I tend to do on everything, um, both of these tracks have Decapitator on them, um, which is a fantastic distortion plugin from uh, Sound Toys. It's not just distortion, I, I feel like I use it just for warm drive as well. Uh, I used it way more before I got the analog heat, but uh, they, I still use, them, uh, use it because they do sort of different things. Um, so that's a great plugin. Uh, I also have uh, some Runsitter. UHE's uh, filter plugin, which I like to use. My, every single track I, I use uses this at some point. Uh, I've got a transient master on it, uh, which is a handy plugin to use. Um, and the kick drums just have some gentle compression, uh, just to sort of you know give it that punch and boost. Um, so that's the that's the drum beat. It does change a bit later on. Uh, it goes to like half time. Um, I just I literally just half the sample time, so it sounds like this. Give it a real grind, um, <clears throat> but that's sort of for a bit of a bridging part later on. So let's ignore that for the time being. <clears throat> uh, let's go down here and listen to some of the analog four parts and system Roland system one M parts. Um, and just see what they sound like, so I'm pretty sure this is just the Analog 4. So you can hear some ducking on that, it's because of this uh, sidechain compression over here, which I'll just show on the screen, right here, and I'll show it in action. Uh, I use this uh, built-in Ableton compressor for sidechain stuff all the time. Um, none of the other plugins seem to work with Ableton for sidechaining, um, or at least if they do, it's more complicated. This one is just built-in, works perfectly. Uh, that's I, that's pretty much the only built-in plugin I use. Uh, not because I think they're all shit or anything, but I just feel like uh, I have a lot of other plugins which I really like, um, and I don't see any reason to use the built-in stuff. Um, when I can get a better sound with something else most of the time. <clears throat> um, so it's also got some decapitator, surprise surprise, and uh, some compression using HCOMP by Waves, which I use all the time. Uh, it's my favorite compression plugin. I'm sure there are other ones which sound better. I, I, there are lots of great compression plugins out there, but this one, I, I, I don't know. I've just sort of built a relationship with it. It just works for me. I know it really well. Um, so let's get rid of that. Down here we've got a pad um, using a free plugin which I got not that long ago called the PG8X, which is based, it's an emulation of the JX8P from Roland, um, which JX8P, uh, I didn't actually ever have one of them, but I had a Roland MKS70, as I mentioned before, uh, a Super JX, which is two JX8P stacked on top of each other in a rack. Um, and so this sound is very familiar to me, and even the layout is, uh, the PG800 um, controller that I also had for my MKS70, it looks exactly like this. Like That's, that's the controller, they just digitized it. Um, so this synth, I think, is very evocative of the hardware, and I think it sounds really good, and I use it quite a bit. No, oh, that's it's not solid. As you might expect, I've got some decapitator running on this. Um, I've also got uh, Filter Freak, which is another Sound Toys plugin which I like a lot. I don't use it as much as the UHE filter because I feel like it has more of a, a sound that it applies to the original signal, whereas the UHE one is literally just you like if you have it all the way open, you don't hear the plugin at all until you start filtering, and I really appreciate that. It's transparent, you know, it's uh, invisible, even. Um, <clears throat> Filter Freak adds some color 
um, especially because you've got these drive control or input controls and output, and you can really you can get other interesting effects using it. But it's um, yeah, I, that's why I like to use both of them. Um, <clears throat> So this sound gets increasingly more aggressive as the decapitator drive gets turned up by automation um, and the filtering changes as well. Uh, as you can see the drive uh, automation there. So let's listen to some of that. It gets even more insane over here. Um, but if we listen to that layered with this bass, uh, you get you know some nice tones. And they've both got. Uh, some, uh, that one doesn't, I was going to say they've both got some side chaining going on, but only this one does. But if you listen to it with the beat, um, I feel like you get a better sense of everything. After all this happens, uh, this rhythmic uh, sequence comes in from the Analog 4, which we heard earlier. Um, and it's probably a good time to mention the fact that I've also got, uh, if we just tab over, I've got heaps of return tracks, although these, that one and that one are doing nothing. But I've got a Valhalla Room Reverb, which I use all, Valhalla products, excellent, excellent reverbs. Um, Got a micro shift from Sound Toys, got an Echo Boy from Sound Toys, and I got a little Alter Boy from Sound Toys. And I, I use, like, this is kind of a pretty good example of my general um, sends, send setup that I that I have set, or my, uh, send buses, return buses, whatever you want to call. Um, so you can hear some of that running on this sequence. If we go back to here. reverb and stuff. It's also got some filtering on it down here, uh, more run sitter, and also more decapitator because you can't have enough decapitator. Um, <clears throat> and then later on, to give it more intensity, uh, I fed that initial sound through the analog heat, just here, and uh, achieved this layering effect. The uh, analog heat's really great for um, making anything sound like it is a synth. You know, I know that this was already a synth, but I've applied like uh, filter resonance and frequency and, and envelope following using the analog heat to give it like it sounds like that's the way it sounded coming out of the synth originally. I've just tweaked the filter a bit, so um, it's interesting how you can add those kind of textures after the fact, after you've already recorded it using the analog heat, you can feed it back out, give it more filtering, give it more um, aggression. Um, <clears throat> so let's move on. Um, down here we've got the Ensign TS-12 patch which we played earlier, uh, which I recorded in, which is a bass sound. Let's listen to that. So that's cool, and that plays along with everything else, so if we unmute, if we go from here and unmute stuff. You know, you get a sense of where the track's going. Um, so, over here, this is where things start to break down and change and the track takes on a different vibe. Um, <clears throat> so this whole sort of bridging section is constructed out of uh, TS-12 patches and Zebra 2 patches basically. 
uh, UHE Zebra 2, one of my favorite software since. I've had it for a really long time. Um, so just a quick look at it. Uh, this one's just using one oscillator and uh, one filter, uh, but it's kind of a semi-modular kind of design and you can build your synths kind of however you want. Uh, it's really powerful and excellent sounding software synth. And it's quite old now as well, but it's, uh, I still think it sounds incredible. Um, so these sounds uh, sound like this. I'll, I'll, I've got two layered. They're both playing very similar but different melody lines. And the way they intermingle with each other, I think, is really special, so I'll play them both. Down here, I've got another zebra patch, which is the same exact sound, but it fades in with some filtering and it's playing a different melody, so let's, let's bring that in as well. And then uh, we can also just bring in more stuff. We can bring in this bass, Ansonic TS12 bass synth down here. the idea how this is just continuing to build, continuing to layer, continuing to get more interesting as it goes along. Um, I had a lot of fun building this middle section, it was it's a point of pride for me you might say. Um, so but before we continue with that, let's just listen to these two Ensonic sounds. Uh, one of them we've already heard, which is this sign, sign pad. It's been uh, quite heavily filtered uh, using some EQ um, and it's also been compressed and it's got some reverb on it. Um, <clears throat> but I also recorded in this which I'm sure I've got the MIDI track for it somewhere in here but let's not dwell on that but it's basically it's also a TS12 patch um, which I I played in, I, I recorded and, and sequenced it and, play, and played it in uh, when I got to the computer phase. So this is one of those examples where I write a lot of it at the beginning using the hardware, but then I bring it to the computer and I'm still writing, I'm still adding elements to it. This happens all the time. I mean, all of this whole middle section was just added after I'd recorded the main elements uh, or the initial elements into the door or into Ableton. So let's listen to it. And it only really comes to life when you bring in everything else. So let's bring in all of these elements. In fact, let's just unmute everything and let's just go from here. away around here and you kind of get some space. But it doesn't take long for things to start to fade in real slowly and I've got this um, choir patch here using uh, Native Instruments Contact which I'll just bring up real quick to show you. Uh, here it is. Um, and a bit of filtering using Run Sitter again. Just this one on here. And some decapitator, of course. This one's got a quite extreme drive on it. Um, and some sidechain compression. And uh, this fades in with the high pass filter, and eventually, just you get this really gnarly sound. 
um, which sounds like this. <laughs> where my reactor patch comes in which is basically it's a monarch you may have heard of monarch uh, I use it constantly uh, best software Moog emulation I've ever heard uh, I know there are other good ones too but this one just sounds really great um, super bass response I've never heard anything so bassy except for maybe the system one <laughs> um, even my old Moog Minotaur did not sound as bassy as this that's kind of part of why I sold it because I got monarch and I was like I don't fucking need this anymore um, so, that's sort of playing an alternate bass line um, alongside the TS-12 to give it some sort of dynamic flavour. So, if we listen to both of them, we've got the TS-12 note plays first. It's been a bit filtered. And then the reactor patch plays. They're playing different notes. Uh, I initially had them layered exactly the same, but I thought it was too busy, it was too discordant and uh, I think that some of the bass was um, like the, two, the the note, that lower note on the reactor synth sounded bassier than the higher note did on the reactor synth and the higher note sounded bassier and more full on the TS-12 than the lower note did so I just sort of thought let's just separate them out. Um, <clears throat> I'm pretty happy with those results. Okay so just had to restart the footage just for a second there. Um, had a bit of a near catastrophic failure. So anyway, let's continue. Um, so at this point I've got... Um, we're nearing the end of the track, we've gone through this sort of bridge, we've we've got to this sort of crescendo of sorts, and there's this, tr there's this sound here, which I wasn't sure what it was. Let's listen. Oh. Yeah, that's just the sine wave pad coming back in. Oh, that's right, I remember what I did here. Shit, this was actually kind of interesting. This is the original sound, this one here. Straight from the TS-12 recorded in. But then what I did is I fed that sound out of a little shitty guitar amp I've got sitting over there, and I mic'd, up, mic'd it up, and I got a different sound, which is this one. Kind of a bit distorted, a bit spacey definitely picked up the sound of the room. It's obviously got some reverb on it as well, but just the layering of the two I think was really special. I don't often do those kind of things where I like, uh, you know, mic up an amp and send a signal out, but it's fun, it's always fun to sort of experiment with those kind of things because you can get some really interesting results. And I feel like this is one of those occasions where I totally did. Um, so yeah, as the track uh, sort of unfolds and unwinds, uh, or not unwinds, uh, wraps up, um, what have we got here? Um, what, what happens towards the end of this horrific uh, choir patch is a, um, an SH-101 plug-out patch starts playing, which is, well it's actually, it's a plug-in, um, but you know, this is the plug-out which can be sent to the System 1M and be used sound alone. So I think this is a really great emulation of the 101. And I've got this sound here, which I, uh, a lead line that comes in, which I applied quite late in the process, writing process, which sounds like this. Which if we listen to it in its entirety, Obviously got lots of distortion running, it's got some decapitator, it's got some compression, it's also got Pan Man, which is a really great um, panning plugin from Soundtoys again. Um, 
So I'll just get rid of all this. Uh, it also, I believe, has some Alter Boy stuff running on it as well. <coughs> and some uh, just general kind of uh, <coughs> modulation in using envelopes. Um, got some Crusher. Crush is really great actually, it's like a bitrate reduction thing which all of the um, System 1, System 1M, System 8 um, and the plugouts, they all have this little effect section here which has a reverb, a delay and a crusher and it just sort of destroys the sound. Um, but then once we fade out again, after this chaos... <laughs> some bells that start playing using the same melody that the uh, SH-101 patch was playing um, and they are they are contact instruments basically they're just like marimba and like glockenspiel well that's an organ um, but if we go and listen to that because that's an organ layered with a electric piano, layered with some bells, layered with a zebra patch, which sounds like this all up. So that's kind of a little outro melody. Um, and then effectively it just, the track uh, properly fades out with uh, these sounds again. That's it. That's, that's the whole track. Uh, I feel like I've probably over explained it anyway. Um, <clears throat> but what I'm going to do is, uh, you know, I don't know, once I've edited this video, I'll, I'll chuck at the end of it um, the whole track in its entirety to listen to from beginning to end. Um, because I feel like, you know, you've heard elements here, but to hear it all, the sort of final product, or well, at least what I hope is the final product. Um, you know, I feel like that's important. Um, so, yeah, anyway, that's, that's this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I'll probably do more things like this because I think that it's interesting to learn about people's workflows. I know that I personally really enjoy and value uh, learning about other people's workflows, uh, creative people of all kinds, not just musicians. Um, so hopefully you feel the same <laughs> and you like what I've done. Um, but yeah, that's it for today. Uh, stay tuned for more videos in the future. See you later.